The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Ellen Webb with the Center for Environmental Health. Today we are going to be sharing their perspectives from three panelists covering results from a study that recently came out, which is the first comprehensive look at whether there is risk for adverse neurological and neuro neurodevelopmental harm from unconventional oil and natural gas development, otherwise known as UOG. Specifically, we covered five major pollutant categories associated with fracking and UOG that have put young children at risk. Heavy metals, and in this case, we focused on arsenic and manganese, particulate matter, the BTEX chemicals, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and endocrine disrupting chemicals have been linked to significant neurodevelopmental health problems in infants, children, and young adults. These chemicals have been linked with problems with memory, intellectual function, and learning. In addition, young children that experience frequent exposure to these pollutants are at a particularly high risk for neurological disorders, impulsivity, aggression, and hyperactivity. Today's presentation, we're going to be covering three different topics. First, we're going to be focusing on chemicals associated with UOG development and the significant impact of pollutants on neurodevelopment. Then we are going to be talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals and effects on the developing nervous system. Finally, we're going to close with a pediatric perspective and talk about health needs and policy considerations. I just want to take a moment and recognize the Center for Environmental Health that has helped make all this work possible. We at the Center for Environmental Health focus on the protection of families and communities from toxic chemicals, and the development of this webinar speaks directly to our mission as an organization to be able to provide information and tools to protect communities that are fighting for healthier environments. Before we move on, I just want to briefly talk about UOG and fracking for those of you that may not be familiar. Since the mid to late 2000s, unconventional oil and gas techniques, which include hydraulic fracturing, otherwise known as fracking, has allowed for the extraction of fossil fuels from previously inaccessible geological formations such as shale, leading to the spread of UOG development in the United States and abroad. In layman's terms, fracking is the process of forcing fractures in the rock layer that is put under pressure to extract oil or natural gas. Essentially, though, what's important to understand here is that fracking is just one part of the UOG life cycle and development. Finally, I just want to ask that if attendees have questions, please type in your questions in the chat box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. At the end, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead now and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Eric London. With experience focusing on developmental disorders such as autism, Dr. London will be speaking about some of the chemicals associated with UOG development and the significance of these pollutants on neurodevelopment. Dr. London is the director of the Autism Treatment Research Lab at the New York State Institute for Research in Developmental Disorders. His research includes studies to find very early predictors of autism and related developmental disorders, as well as treatment strategies and healthcare delivery methods for these disorders. In 1995, he and his wife were the founders of the National Alliance for Autism Research, the first major funding sources for research into the aut autistic spectrum disorders. He maintains a clinical psychiatry practice which, which focuses on these disorders. Uh, so Dr. London, uh, you can now go ahead uh, and get started. And just okay. uh, all you have to do is just signal to us um, when, we, when you want to switch the slide. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, the uh, talk that I prepared is really going to be focused a little bit more on understanding the research. The uh, article that we put out um, has uh, many, many references and uh, uh, voluminous uh, explanations of uh, what the possible problems could be. 
But reading the um, research, especially in brain development and brain, is uh, a little bit trickier than um, in other facets of medicine. Uh, so put up the next slide. And the first reason why it's so difficult is because the brain is so complex. Um, as you see, uh, this comes from the Franklin Institute, uh, and they say 86 billion neurons. Uh, I never counted, but something in that effect, and 100 trillion connections. So this is the most complicated machine in the world, and... Um, Rather than uh, worry about the whole thing, next slide. Next slide. This is, uh, whoop, no, go back to the brain, good. Um, so this is a slide also from the Franklin Institute, uh, looking at just um, 500,000 uh, cells and the tracks that they form and you can see they're color-coded. And uh, what you need to understand about brain function is that uh, the brain could malfunction anywhere uh, along these tracks. Uh, the old model of neurology uh, was kind of taken from stroke, where there was just a focal area which was going wrong. The more modern approach to neurology is that there are systems which are malfunctioning, and the systems could be remote from the area that looks like it's uh, affected. So, for example, um, I, I don't know if um, uh, there's any way to point, um, but uh, the cortex, the, uh, in the upper areas, um, if that's a particular area related to, say, to speech or language, or uh, the problems may actually be down in the lower centers of the brain and uh, dysregulating uh, what's going on. Next slide. So among the other problems are the ones just inherent in dealing with environmental issues. And I, I, I'm using the word xenobiotics. It's what's used a lot in the medical literature. It just basically means a substance that's not supposed to be there. So uh, there are certain substances in, in the human body which are naturally there and should be in good amounts. But if they're not, and if these substances don't belong in the human body, such as, let's say, a heavy metal, uh, that's called a xenobiotic. So... Um, the first thing that needs to be understood is that xenobiotics uh, can't be studied prospectively in humans. We can't give poisons to people and uh, have a control group and see who does better. Um, therefore, all studies, uh, environmental studies, must be incidental. That is the result of an already ex uh, existent exposure. Um, and when you have these, what we might call natural experiments, um, it's almost impossible to know the extent of the exposures. Um, so people might wander in and out of areas which are exposed, the wind might blow, uh, there might be a period of time when the toxin is being uh, spewed. So uh, it makes for a very complicated situation. Um, much more complicated than other facets of research, such as genetics, where um, you can pretty much um, control for everything. Anyhow, due to the lack of controlled conditions, nearly all human studies must be population-based epidemiologic study with very large numbers on heterogeneous populations. Um, and the effect would have to be very strong to obtain statistical significance. So what, what, what that means is um, because we can't select people who are going to be exposed, uh, scientists need to study very, very large groups. And um, some people will be vulnerable to a particular xenobiotic um, based on their genetics, but we can't just study those people. It's probably too difficult to combine that with, with exposures. So um, e even if this could be done, it would be extremely expensive and it is rarely done in practice. Next slide. Next slide. 
Okay, and now I'm going to shift a little bit away from just the, the the environmental component to the difficulty back to the brain component to the difficulty. Um, the endpoint targets of brain functioning are still poorly defined and difficult to measure. So one example would be IQ. Um, it's a complex combination of many circuits, millions of cells, billions of synapses. Um, and the baseline for IQ is on a continuum. It's not that there's a normal IQ and um, uh, everyone else, if you don't have a normal IQ, then you're affected. Uh, the IQ is on a continuum, um, even for what we would call control populations. So you take a number, which is the IQ, and we, we assign it a number, but it's just the, a gross approximation of brain functioning. And it really doesn't dig down into what's really going on. Um, and then I could say similar things about language, motor skills, attention, or social skills. All of these things are very difficult to measure. Now, I'll contrast that with liver or kidney damage, which is much easier to measure. One or two blood tests can very often give you a very good idea what's going on in the liver, um, for example. Um, and liver cells are very uniform, and so you have many, many cells which are doing the same thing. Not true in the brain. Um, so studies of the components of these measures are very difficult and costly to do, requiring a great deal of time and expensive equipment. And funding for these studies is rarely available. Next slide. Okay, more troubles with the brain, um, and I mentioned this already, the, the, the types of cells. Each cell in the brain is unique, has unique connections. Um, so uh, if you have something that's damaging in the liver, it'll start to damage all the cells fairly uniformly. Not true in the brain. Uh, the brain, with its enormous number of cells, uh, has enormous variability in cell types. Sometimes uh, a, an environmental toxicant might only damage one cell type, for example. Um, another problem is that the brain undergoes a long period of development, and there are many, many factors that can alter development, um, some of which are environmental toxicants, but even things like uh, learning the food we eat, uh, the uh, amount that we're held as children, all these things affect brain development. Um, and the last thing is the timing of the, uh, the, uh, the exposures dictates the effect that it'll have. And I have more about that later. Next, next slide. Okay, so in, in, in most of uh, biomedical studies, we learn a lot from animal studies, but animal studies also have a lot of limitations when we're studying the brain. Um, so, for example, animals don't have many of the higher functions that we're interested in. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, animals, for the most part, don't have language. Um, certainly, they don't have language to the extent humans have language. And so, getting a good animal model for language is very challenging. Um, and humans have brain structures, and I'll mention just one, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which other animals don't even have. And these brain structures are instrumental in what we would call higher functioning. So um, they, they actually do studies on mice with psychiatric drugs, which makes no sense because we're targeting uh, structures that the, the mice don't even have. Um, and so, um, we could use higher animals such as apes, which have um, uh, brain structures closer to humans. However, it, apes are generally not used due to ethical and economic reasons. And so for the most part, animal studies only give us a very gross picture of what's going on in the brain. Next slide. Okay, so I talked a little bit about development, and this is the first couple of weeks of development. Uh, this is uh, what the organism looks like, and you can see um, a, a number, uh, letter D, there's the neural tube, and 
brain up there. Um, these are the precursors of um, what's going to be the nervous system. And as you could see, if something happens to it at this level, it would obviously be dramatic and as a matter of fact, uh, probably catastrophic because uh, it's the very beginnings of development. Next slide. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, one of the things that has been shown for some of these toxicants is um, neurotube closure defect. And this is what the neurotube closure looks like. This takes place um, very early in development in humans between about day 20 and 24. And it's responsible for some diseases such as spina bifida and. Um, and encephaly. Uh, there are some theories actually that uh, neurotube closure, maybe not a complete neuro, uh, deficit in neurotube closure, can cause some other brain problems, including autism. There, there's been, actually been some theories about that. Next slide. So I gave you some slides about the very early development. This is looking at it from the point of view of when people develop various skills. And as you can see, um, many of them happen in the first two years of life, but not all of them. So if and when there's an exposure, um, it matters very much when in development the exposure takes place. Um, and so if you have a high level of a particular toxicant in an area, um, you may or may not get uniform problems because different people might be exposed at different times. Um, you know, for example, if you look at language, language continues to develop here all the way up to about age seven, whereas um, uh, some other things might end at age four and be fairly uh, adult level. Next slide. Okay, so in brain development, there are actually five processes, five major processes that things get broken down to. Proliferation means the cells just divide, and a toxicant, for example, can make cells not divide. Um, that's proliferation. Migration, then, after the cells divide, the cells are sent to the parts of the brain where they're needed, so they actually migrate, and that's a difficult process. If they don't migrate correctly, they won't be in the right place and they won't function correctly. Then comes differentiation with the development of axons and dendrites, but also differentiate neurochemically. Some cells are dopamine cells, some cells become GABA cells, and they take on different roles in their places. Then myelination. Myelination is a fatty sheath that goes around the axon. Now, I have a picture of it later on. Um, and that creates the environment for the rapidity of the electronic transfer of signal from one cell to the other. Now, uh, even if everything is hooked up correctly, if the cell is not sending the message at the right speed, it won't coordinate with other cells and the functions will deteriorate. And the last one is synaptogenesis, which is basically forming synapses between one cell and another. Uh, another name for that is actually learning. Um, as, you, as the cells synapse, they make connections and that uh, actually enables you to acquire new skills. Next slide. So all of these, uh, th those five processes uh, go on during brain development, um, and a lot of that is done in utero. Um, this slide illustrates what goes on after birth, and it illustrates one point. As you notice, the newborn has relatively few cells as you get older more and more. By two-year-old, there's many, many cells and many, many connections. And uh, it's not so obvious, but the adult actually has less than the two-year-old. So a process of pruning takes place where the uh, young child keeps developing more and more connections, but some of these connections are not useful, not used, and they go away. And that's good because if they don't go away, there would be too much noise in the brain. There would be too much going on. And uh, if you know two-year-olds, it's not 
too hard to overstimulate them. Next slide. Okay, and this basically uh, illustrates what I was just talking about, that um, uh, the, the metabolism or the amount of energy going into the brain peaks at about four, then it goes down, and some synaptic connections are uh, this, um, disentangled. And um, by about age 10, you're having about adult level of brain energy consumption. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, this is the picture that I was talking about. So uh, just to illustrate some of the things I was saying, so you could see the cell body on the left with the nucleus in the middle, the soma is the body, and then those dendrites send the signals to that cell. Then that cell sends uh, the signal through the axon and through that purple myelin sheath, that's the myelinization we were talking about, and it ends... Um, uh, with the uh, axon terminals to the next cell. And so um, there are many things that could go wrong with this, including a a dendrite or axon formation. But uh, with some of the diseases and some of the research has shown uh, problems with uh, the myelin and the myelin formation. Next slide. Okay, another problem with the research is the concept of categorical diagnosis. So the medical research agencies that fund research, uh, for the most part, demand diagnoses. Not 100%. You can do experiments, sometimes not using diagnoses, but very often you do have to use diagnoses. So the NIH, the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, um, very often wants the research to be based around diagnoses. Now, this is not good for brain research. It's much more suitable for things like infectious diseases. Um, so we have the problem, again, with the brain where um, there's a, a huge amount of variability and the diseases don't fall out nicely like they do in, in infectious diseases. One of the uh, outcomes of this is that Let's say you have a toxicant and there's an increase in symptomatology. So uh, let's say you have a, a, a slowing down of neural conduction. This may or may not lead to any increase in disease. So if the research is to set up whether or not a toxicant is related to disease, it may not, even though it's harming the brain. Um, so... For example, if the whole population's IQ were to drop by a couple of points, it might not be reflected in any diagnostic issues. Um, one reason would be even though more people would fit into the uh, mentally defective range, um, the IQ test would be renormed and again, people would come out with similar IQs. So we do have so many problems with categorizing exactly what's going on with the brain. Next slide. Another issue is the control populations. And um, in the United States, over 100 million people are living in places where particulate matter concentrations are above the EPA standards. So who are your controls? You have to you have to go far and wide to find people who actually are not being overexposed to particulate matter. In the United States, 123 million uh, people are exposed to ozone levels above standards. Um, now, the next bullet, most outdoor PM is particulate matter. 2.5 means the very small particles, less than 2.5 microns. But that could be generated from many, many sources, tailpipes, brake ignitions, et cetera. And um, so if you're looking for whether or not this is coming from oil drilling, there's going to be a huge amount of noise in the system because these pollutants are coming from all kinds of places. And even more difficult would be uh, indoor pollution. Um, I'm sorry, my computer's acting. Uh, indoor pollution. Um, and over 3 billion people on the earth rely on biomass, wood, charcoal, crop residue, and dung, 
and coal is their primary source of domestic energy, meaning they're breathing all these things uh, anyhow uh, without any particular industrial effect. Next slide. And the other big problem in research is funding. Um, so I put up some numbers here. The National Cancer Institute has a budget, this 2014 numbers, of $5 billion a year, heart and lung, uh, $3 billion, allergy and infectious disease, $4.5 billion. The total NIH budget was $30 billion. So the NIEHS, which is the National Institute of Environmental Health and Safety, which is the agency which funds environmental effects, um, has a $700 million budget, but some of that includes Department of Interior appropriations for Superfund sites. I was unable to find that number, so I really don't know how much we would need to subtract, but in any case, you could see that 700 million out of 30 billion is going towards environmental toxicant research, whereas the Infectious Disease Organization is getting four and a half billion. I suspect uh, that uh, that has something to do with uh, there not being a lobby for infectious diseases. Um, this year, the EPA uh, is getting a $500 million cut, which is 65% of all the cuts to the Department of Interior. So environmental research is not well-funded in America. Um, right now, uh, all biomedical research is suffering. Um, the National Institute of Mental Health, which is the organization I'm most interested in, um, has a funding line of about seven or eight percent, meaning 92 percent of grants are, are not funded. So imagine uh, that with uh, an agency that has even less money. It's nearly impossible to get funding uh, for most projects. Next slide. So I, I thought I would end the talk just by uh, listing some of the findings which we put in our paper um, for uh, some of the um, xenobiotics. So this one is particulate matter. Um, so particulate matter causes inflammation associated with many disorders, including autism, bipolar, schizophrenia, and anxiety disorder. And there's white matter hyperintensities. Remember, we were talking about the myelin sheath. Um, and these white matter findings are associated with dementia, lower IQs, death, blood-brain barrier disruption, and neuroinflammation. And high particulate matter levels is correlated with lesions and structure in the brain stem, which mediates auditory processing balance and autonomic regulation. That Last one is actually very exciting for me because very few scientists have ever looked at the brain stem. Um, and these uh, things like auditory processing and balance and autonomic regulations are very important for developmental disorders. Okay, next slide. Okay, the next uh, xenobiotic I talk about here is polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, most of this research has been done in New York City at Columbia University, and there's some pretty elegant research uh, that's been done. They've actually taken pregnant women with nasal cannulas so they can actually measure how much of the uh, toxicant uh, they've been breathing in, which is actually very unusual. And uh, so this is a more elegant uh, type of research than, than most of the others we would encounter. Um, so uh, PAH exposures, and again, this is in, in utero in pregnancy, are associated with a small for growth, small growth uh, in utero, reduced body length, reduced weight and head circumference, and more likely to be preterm. And these findings are associated with developmental disorders. So in other words, they, they could study things like head circumference or weight. Um, they didn't necessarily uh, able to study it with the diagnosed developmental disorders, for maybe for reasons I was talking about before. High levels of PAH in the placenta were associated with a four and a half uh, 
fold increase in neuro uh, tube defects. And I showed you that slide earlier on about the neural tube defects, age 20 to 24 days in utero. Uh, the prenatal uh, PAH exposures are correlated with impaired neurodevelopment at three years of age, including reductions in IQ scores. So the group studied this out to age three. Another problem that researchers have is continuing to get funded. So once you've had a, a finding uh, at birth, that doesn't mean that you're not going to see something different as the person ages. Diseases like autism start um, usually about age two to three. Um, so if you don't follow people to age three, you won't find any autism. Um, in the old research, much of the toxicant research just looked right after birth. And if they did well with their APGAR scores, they called them normal, but in fact, they probably were at high risk for many things. Anyhow, the last one, the PAH exposure is associated with reduced white matter and high scores for attention deficit, reduced processing speed and conduct disorder, and poor self-regulatory. Next slide. And this slide is about heavy metals, and the two that we uh, looked at in our paper was arsenic and manganese. Um, Here's one that studied them for 14 years after exposure to arsenic, associated with higher rates of mental retardation um, uh, and epilepsy. 15 out of 17 epidemiologic studies on arsenic found defects in intelligence and memory, and some of the effects were found at levels lower than current safe standards. In utero, arsenic exposure was associated with poor self-regulatory functioning. And the high manganese exposure affects learning, memory, motor function, deficits, and behavior. Okay, next slide. So these are my general conclusions. Um, due to all the problems which I outlined, I think it's fair to say that the existing studies are most likely an underestimate of the real problem of what's going on in the brain based on uh, toxicants. And number two, definitive studies are not likely to be done in the foreseeable future for the reasons I mentioned. These studies, to really do definitive studies, would be nearly impossible, even if the funding was available, which it's generally not. And as a public health issue, making decisions based on only definitive studies will result in an undetermined but large amount of morbidity and mortality, although our paper doesn't go into mortality this time. but. Um, so the idea that there's not proof is kind of asinine. So rather than concluding that the studies are not elegant, a strong precautionary principle is necessary. And I, my example is that there really are no good studies to show that driving 90 miles an hour in a residential neighborhood is harmful. So if you're looking for proof for that, there is none. And I'm afraid that uh, if we want to be realistic about public health, we're going to have to um, take all the things we talked about just now into account. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you. OK, great. Thanks, Dr. London, uh, for educating us about neurodevelopment and chemical exposure. I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Heather Potasol. Dr. Potasol is going to be talking about endocrine disrupting chemicals and their effects on developing nervous system. Dr. Potasol is a professor of biological sciences at North Carolina State University. Dr. Potasol received her PhD from Emory University in 2001 and explores the mechanisms by which endocrine disrupting chemicals and compounds alter a neuroendocrine pathways in the brain related to sex specific physiology and behavior. She is specifically interested in how estrogenic compounds, including phytoestrogens and flame retardants, impact the neural pathways, which coordinate the physical and behavioral changes that occur across development and through the pubertal transition. She has participated in several national and international expert panels and workshops related to health effects associated with endocrine disruptors, including the 2010 World Health Organization Expert Panel on the health risks of BPA.
and the 2012 workshop on low-dose effects of endocrine active chemicals, co-organized by the U.S. National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences and the Joint Research Center's Institute for Health and Consumer Protection. Uh, So welcome, Heather. I'm now going to turn this over to you so you can go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you, Um, and thank you for that kind introduction. I'm going to build a little bit on what Dr. Linden talked about in terms of brain development, and then talk about how endocrine um, endocrine disrupting chemicals can alter that brain development and function. Next slide. So male and female brains are different, and they're different in a variety of ways. And those differences are what's interesting to my laboratory, because these neuroanatomical and behavioral differences are largely shaped by steroid hormones. And so those are the estrogens and the androgens, the best known of which is testosterone. And so to me, it's not entirely implausible to think that endocrine disrupting chemicals can interfere with the role of these hormones and thus interfere with sexually dimorphic brain organization and behavior. Next slide. So first we have to define what an endocrine disrupting chemical is. And if you Google it, you're gonna find a whole bunch of different definitions. And that's because the definition um, also often depends on how it is being functionally used. So if it's being used for regulatory purposes, it may have a slightly different type of wording than if it's being used for scientific purposes. And so what I wanted to highlight here was the Endocrine Society's definition of an endocrine disrupting compound because the Endocrine Society is interested from a purely scientific perspective. And so they define it as an exogenous, which means outside the body, chemical substance or mixture that alters the structure or function of the endocrine system. So next slide. So there's been a variety of um, workshops and meetings surrounding the question of how endocrine disruptors can affect health. I'm highlighting two of them here. Um, Both of them are available online if anyone's interested. But the short end of this is that there's a whole bunch of disorders and diseases that that are now thought to be um, related to EDC exposure. And you'll often, on a cover of a report like this, see a pregnant woman or a pregnant belly. And that's because it's thought that fetal development is a particularly vulnerable time to these chemicals, as Dr. London has highlighted. Um, And so we think about the, the does fetal development as being a particularly sensitive time. And so some of the disorders that are associated with EDC exposure can be heart disease, obesity, metabolic problems, and then neurodevelopment. So where are all these EDCs coming from? Next slide. So there's a variety of sources. Um, So uh, some of them are natural. So soy phytoestrogens are natural. Plants make these very endocrine active compounds. Um, Metals can be endocrine disrupting. There's a lot of chemicals in personal care products, um, pesticides, even the coatings of pharmaceuticals. Some we design pharmaceuticals to be endocrine disrupting, like birth control pills, Um, and then industrial chemicals, of which fracking fluid is one of them. Next slide. So this is a map that came from Earth Justice, showing where there has been what they call a fraccident or some sort of accident or spill associated with fracking. So wherever there is oil and gas, there is going to be a spill. All pipelines leak, all fracking stations are subject to accident. And so when we're thinking about oil and gas activity, we always have to be mindful of of the risk of accident and what could happen with accident. And in many of these cases, it's contamination of drinking water. And so the source of exposure from this is going to be oral. Although there are also, risks associated with air pollution um, associated with these activities. Next slide. So the big problem with fracking fluid is we don't necessarily know what's in it. Um, A lot of times it's described as being proprietary. Um, If you go through the literature, there's about 700 chemicals that have been approved to be in fracking fluid, Um, maybe 100, 150 of those at EDCs, but it's truly a secret sauce. So as scientists, we do not always know what we're dealing with. So even if you discover that that fracking fluid is toxic or has some sort of effect, because it is such a complex mixture, it can be very difficult to pinpoint which chemical or chemicals 
is the bad actor. And so when we're thinking about how chemicals affect our bodies, it's sometimes very hard to know where these chemical exposures are coming from. And so for people that are living around these intense um, oil and gas activities, contamination of groundwater and that sort of thing may be a significant source of exposure. Next slide. So some EDCs you may have heard of include BPA, bisphenol A, phthalates, which, which make plastics soft and are in a lot of cosmetics, flame retardants, um, pesticides, herbicides like atrazine, perchlorate, perfluorinated compounds, that sort of thing. Everything that I have in yellow here is likely to be in, in fracking fluid, but there's no definitive evidence that it is. Um, the estimates, again, vary, but, but somewhere around 100, 130, 150 EDCs are likely to be in fracking fluid. But because the list is proprietary, it's really difficult to know. Um, perfluorinated compounds are used um, as anti-stick compounds. So when you're thinking about how fracking works and you have to get water down into these really porous types of materials and surfaces, it's not unlikely that they would want a surfactant to, to do that kind of job. Um, so when you think about the function of these chemicals and how they're used, that's how you can think of whether or not they might be in fracking fluid. Next slide. So what is the endocrine system, right? So this diagram um, that I use in class all the time with my students illustrates the primary endocrine glands. So these are glands in the body that are producing and secreting hormones. So when most people think of hormones, they think of estrogen and androgen, which is secreted by the gonads, so the ovary and testis, or maybe thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland. But there are a whole lot of other uh, hormones in our bodies, like insulin that's secreted from the pancreas. And we know most about how EDCs affect estrogen, androgen, and thyroid, but not so much about some of these other hormones that, can, that are important, not just for our physiology as adults, but also in development. Next slide. So the, the part of the brain called the hypothalamus is, is sort of the big boss of the endocrine system. So it generates a bunch of peptide hormones and other signaling molecules that tell the rest of, of the body how to respond and what type of hormones it should make. And even though we have these major glands when we think of hormone production, almost every cell in the body is hormone sensitive. So when we think about the endocrine system at sort of the 30,000 foot view, it's basically the in entire body. The heart is responsive, bone is responsive, pretty much every cell in your body is responsive. And so this diagram illustrates some of the other types of hormones that are released by some of the major endocrine glands. So things like oxytocin and vasopressin and even dopamine, a classic uh, neurotransmitter in some circus cir circumstances can act like a hormone. And my lab's particularly interested in oxytocin vasopressin. Next slide. So this is a picture of an area of the brain called the paraventricular nucleus. And the uh, neurons in green are secreting oxytocin and the neurons in red are secreting vasopressin. Um, some of that is released in the circulation and controls things like blood pressure and uterine contractions. But a lot of it stays in the brain, and the specialized neurons that make oxytocin and vasopressin that stays in the brain, um, those, those hormones are controlling mostly social and affiliative type of behaviors. And so these types of pathways have been studied in the interest of trying to understand the biological basis of complex diseases like autism um, and other disorders of sociality. And there can be huge sex differences in these circuits. Um, and we know that estrogen is really important, and probably androgen too and shaping how these circuits are crafted in early development and how they're shaped over time. Um, so when we think about endocrine disruption, we have to think a bit bigger than just estrogen and androgen um, and think about some of these other hormones as well that we know a little bit less about and how they might be vulnerable to chemical exposure. Next slide. So Dr. London did a fabulous job of sort of laying out the development of the brain and this slide sort of sums it up. There's sort of four major steps. First, you have to have induction and create your neural tube. Then you have to give birth to neurons and glia. They have to move where they're supposed to go. And then they have to connect and then they have to become myelinated. And so we sort of think about this as a developmental process. And in my first couple of slides, I showed you a, a pregnant belly. And so we think about fetal development as being sort of a critical period 
But even after the, the human brain is born, it's still in a critical period. Next slide. So Dr. London highlighted some of these too, with a little bit of a different graphic, but there's these little bumps in development where the brain is, is in a particular critical period for a different function. So he mentioned language, and language is on here too. Um, higher cognitive function occurs much later, even into adolescence. And so the brain is changing and responding to its environment throughout this entire period. And for a lot of these critical periods, thyroid hormones involved, there's other hormones involved, determining when these windows, these critical windows open and close, um, and also shape how um, the brain changes during that period of time. And so when we think about how our how things like social interactions in adolescence shape our worldview, it's hormones that are sort of facilitating that transition of what we're experiencing and then how the brain responds. And that's going to be true for chemical exposures also. Next slide. And this is a somewhat old set of data, but I really like it because it shows that even for those of us in middle age, we're still in a critical period. So the first, the two graphs on the top and the one on the left, bottom left, um, are illustrating uh, gray matter volume across age. So as you age, you're losing gray matter. Um, you're gaining white matter, but you're losing gray matter, except in the cortex, which is the one sort of inverted U-shaped curve down on the bottom right. And so you can see this volumetric change in cortex actually goes up and kind of peaks in middle age before it declines. And so it sort of illustrates that, that our brain is constantly changing and evolving, and evolving. So in some ways, we're always in a critical period. But we have to think about that when we're thinking about exposures, because at one point in time, maybe the hypothalamus is most susceptible. At other parts in time, it might be the cerebellum or the cortex or the temporal lobe or something like that. And sort of it gives us as scientists a map of sort of where in the brain um, the vulnerabilities are most likely. Next slide. So, okay. So there's a lot of different evidence for um, endocrine disruption outcome in animal models and humans. And so as Dr. London correctly pointed out, animal models have a lot of limitations, but we can, we can model a lot of basic elements of brain development and function using different animal models. And so I've listed some of those effects here. Some I've reported in my own work and others have been seen in other laboratories, but the reduction or loss of brain sex differences is a big one. Um, we see that in almost every system we look, that if you get exposure to endocrine disrupting compounds, there's a risk that you're gonna reduce or lose critical brain sex differences that control sex differences in physiology and behavior. Um, EDCs have also been shown to impair different aspects of memory and learning. There's some evidence they alter social behaviors, um, even feeding and metabolic function types of behaviors, uh, reproductive behavior, including things like the timing of puberty, um, and the length of fertility in females. And Philippe Jean Green, in his book, Only One Chance, summarizes um, a, a big volume of literature about how exposures in, to EDCs have been linked to different types of effects in humans. So that list is a little bit shorter in humans. And because we're using epidemiology data, it can be a little bit harder to show causality. But this is sort of the link of things that we're worried about when we think about neurodevelopment and EDCs. Next slide. So this is an example, and you don't have to know what, what, it, what AVPV means to understand this example. But for the scientists listening, it's the anterior ventral paraventricular nucleus. And this is the part of the brain that controls ovulation. So it's highly sexually dimorphic. It's much larger in females than in males, which makes sense because females ovulate and males don't. Um, there's different types of proteins that are being expressed in females versus males. And it has all kinds of different connections. So there's connections that exist in females that don't exist in males and vice versa. Um, and, and steroid hormones play a big role in shaping the sex differences of this region. And so me and others have shown repeatedly that this region can be masculinized by endocrine disruptors in females and that it can be feminized by endocrine disruptors in males, particularly things that mimic estrogen. So this is just one example of an area of the brain that we've found to be vulnerable to EDCs. And so sometimes we use it as like a marker to find out if things are, if chemicals are endocrine disrupting. Next slide. Um, 
so this is something that's true in both rats and humans. And, and so at first, the testis is actually pretty active um, and is secreting a lot of testosterone. In rats, we have a really good idea about what that testosterone is doing. In humans, it's a little bit unclear. Um, but it emphasizes that hormones have both organizational and activational roles. So whatever that testosterone is doing early in development, it's building things, it's shaping things. And once it's shaped and built, you can't undo it. So those effects are likely to be permanent. Where the testosterone that's coming up later, sort of that activational role of testosterone, is, how, is what happens to the body after puberty. So it's how the body sort of transforms itself from its prepubescent state to a fully adult state. And so if you muck around with androgen in adulthood, you could potentially get temporary effects that can be relieved once you restore levels to normal. And it can have a whole variety of effects on a bunch of different brain regions, and I've just highlighted some of them here. Next slide. And this is a pretty technical slide, but for the scientists that are listening, um, what's interesting to know about rodents is the males at birth are secreting a whole bunch of testosterone. But that testosterone, once it gets to the brain, gets converted to estrogen. It's actually estrogen that's masculinizing the rodent's brain. And so when that male pup grows up and becomes an adult, he is going to secrete GnRH and other hormones in a very male-specific pattern, and he will show steroid negative feedback. The female rat pup, her ovaries are quiescent. They're not secreting any hormones. So in the absence of testosterone and the absence of estrogen, her brain will feminize, and she, when she becomes an adult, will be capable of generating these LH surges that precede ovulation so that she can ovulate. I can completely sex reverse that in my laboratory. I can give a female pup either estrogen or androgen on the day of birth, and all of a sudden her brain will look male, and she will be incapable of secreting that LH required for ovulation. Same with a male. I can castrate him at birth, and then his brain will be capable of steroid positive feedback. And so endocrine disruptors can do the very same thing. If, they're, if they come on board at this really critical point in time, where the brain is undergoing this masculinization, feminization, then the effects that you see are going to show up at the point where, where this, these animals attempt to become pregnant. Um, and so we worry about that when we think about endocrine disruption in humans. Next slide. So some key principles of endocrine disruption is that exposure is going to be low but constant. There's a cocktail of chemicals in our households and bodies at any time. Exposure is always going to be highest in children because they're messy. They're on the floor, they put things in their mouth, and they, they just have higher exposures. Latency from exposure to effects can be long. It can be decades. So you can get exposed to a chemical that alters the way the ovary works and not realize that until a female is trying to become pregnant. Or a chemical may heighten risk of prostate cancer, and that may not become apparent until much later. And effects are very likely to be sex-specific. Um, they're going to be subtle but potentially significant. So things like changes in puberal timing, changes in IQ or sperm production. So not like a classic tumor or things we see in, in toxicology. Next slide. And so there's basic me mechanisms of endocrine disruption. This is a really short list. Scientists like me spend a lot of time trying to understand these different mechanisms. The gestalt is that you get disrupted hormone production or action. And you can get that because a chemical either alters hormone synthesis, so the ability of your body to make the hormone. Um, it can alter the cell sensitivity, so it can change the levels of receptors that are there and how well the cell can respond to that hormone. It can be a complete receptor mimic, like an estrogen agonist. So any women on birth control pills are taking estrogen and progesterone agonists. That's what they're designed to do. Um, a chemical can act as a receptor antagonist, so it can come in and block different effects of hormones. It can also alter hormone clearance. So all hormones are metabolized. And so if, a, if an EDC comes in and alters the metabolism of estrogen, you might have higher levels of estrogen than you're supposed to, or something like that. So these are sort of the basic mechanisms by which EDCs can affect the body. Next slide. And I want to close with some of the examples that we highlighted in the paper. These were done by Christopher Casotis who was working in Susan Nagel's lab at the University of Missouri when he started this work and is now at Duke University. 
um, where he looked at endocrine disrupting activity along some of these oil and gas sites. So this particular paper um, was done in West Virginia, and so this illustration depicts where the water samples were taken, and then he used a cell assay to assess uh, the endocrine disrupting activity of the water he obtained from these different sites. Next slide. So this graph kind of summarizes that activity. So the top of the graph is showing antagonist activity, so how endocrine disruptors can block um, the effects of hormones. And the bottom half of the slide shows agonist activity, or the capacity for this water sort of mimicking the effect of hormones. And it's, and it's broken up into different blocks. So like the, the green blocks is anti-androgenic or anti-testosterone types of effects. So these are, these are water samples, so it's impossible to know which specific chemicals are doing what. But what they show is that you have this very strong EDC activity, both agonist and antagonist, from these sites that are near um, oil and gas activity. Next slide. And so Chris also did a similar study in Colorado, and again, this is one of the illustrations from his paper, and I quoted um, from his conclusion there that out of, out of the 39 water samples collected, um, and you can see the percentages, but a big percentage exhibited estrogenic, anti-estrogenic, androgenic activities. So this, this is a compelling series of studies showing that the water surrounding these sites does have endocrine disrupting activities. Now it's impossible to know what those chemicals are without doing other types of studies, and then it's gonna take further work to attribute those chemicals specifically to oil and gas, but it gives us a first clue. Next slide. So what do we know and what do we not know? We, we do know that there's abundant evidence from humans and animals and lots of other types of studies showing that many chemicals are endocrine disrupting. And a variety of studies have linked them with all kinds of chronic effects, including elevated risk of hormone-dependent cancers like mammary gland cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, lots of reproductive um, and neuroendocrine impairments. We don't know that EDCs definitively cause a specific human neural disease. That goes back to Dr. London's comments that it's very hard to link a chemical exposure to a clinically diagnosed condition like schizophrenia without doing direct experimentation on humans. And it, we just cannot do that. So that gets into what we cannot know. We cannot establish that cause and effect in humans because the experiments required to do that would be unethical. But we can certainly make strong inferences from the data we already have. Next slide. So to summarize, endocrine disruptors pose numerous health risks. Our exposure is nearly universal, and it appears from the work of Chris Kosotis and others that oil and gas operations could be a significant but poorly understood source. Um, in this case, exposure from the drinking water is probably the biggest concern. And we do know that EDCs can get into breast milk, amniotic fluid, and cord blood. They've been detected in placenta. So if we're exposing mom, we're worried about exposing the offspring. And we're involuntarily exposing multiple generations at once because if you expose a pregnant mother and she is pregnant with her daughter, her daughter in utero is forming the germ cells that are going to create the grandchildren. So when you expose a pregnant mother, you're actually exposing three generations at once. Um, and evidence for health effects related to EDC exposure is robust and growing, and there's been numerous reports on that. And my final slide is just to acknowledge um, my funders, NIEHS, and here at the Center for Human Health and the Environment, where we work on these questions all the time. Um, the Endocrine Society, and of course, Chris and Susan for the data that I highlighted and the references for their work is in that slide. And uh, I co-authored a book with Scott Belcher earlier this year on the topic of EDC's brand behavior, if anyone is interested. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patasol, for your really interesting presentation. Uh, we are now going to turn this over to our final speaker, Dr. Larissa Jerska. Dr. Durska is a graduate of Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Following residency and board certification in pediatrics, she practiced general pediatrics and held the position of director of pediatrics at Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck, New Jersey. Dr. Durska is a SUNY, uh, State University of New York, Sullivan Community College Board of Trustees member since 2009. 
She was appointed by Governor Patterson and has served as a secretary of the board. Dr. Durska has become an advocate for public health on the issue of oil and gas exploration and production. She is a founding member of Sullivan Area Citizens for Responsible Energy Development. Together with fellow New York medical colleagues, she founded Concerned Health Professionals of New York and has been involved in the production of four editions of their compendium of scientific, medical, and media findings demonstrating risks and harms of fracking. She is also on the executive board of Physicians for Social Responsibility of New York. So welcome, Dr. Durska. Um, I'm going to turn this over to you, and you may now begin. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, pediatricians have found that all too often children, although they're the largest vulnerable population, are uh, mostly marginalized when it comes to regulations, and that includes environmental laws. And that was the case when we started reviewing the uh, Supplemental Generic Environmental Impact Statement in New York. And it's certainly the case with many uh, uh, federal laws and regulations. Next slide. Dr. Frederica Pereira has written as, uh, that as many as one in six American children has a neurodevelopmental disability, which includes, can include autism, IQ loss, learning problems, um, ADD, and speech or cognitive delays. And they're occurring globally, and it's been called a silent epidemic. This brain drain uh, includes very even at very low levels chemicals in air pollution that have lifelong health consequences and the concern is um, as dr patasol and dr london pointed out they're in, uh, encountered during the critical first uh, thousand days of of life prenatal newborn infancy and toddlerhood the period when brains are developing most rapidly in 2016, uh, scientific and medical associations across um, numerous disciplines, toxicology, public health, pediatrics, and uh, neurobiologists uh, joint, uh, issued a, a joint public health statement in the peer-reviewed journal Environmental Health Perspectives. And it was, it's the project uh, uh, called TENDER. Tar targeting environmental neurodevelopmental risks. And they issued the statement that highlights their consensus, consensus position uh, that based on convincing evidence, and um, they declared that dangers to children around the world warrant meaningful and immediate action. And, and their concern is about um, neurodevelopmentally toxic chemicals. Next slide. To address that, my colleagues, uh, and I commend them highly for um, focusing on this, on, on to toxins in um, children and, um, and um, on mothers um, at the Center for Environmental Health. And Ellen Webb, in particular, spearheaded a series of publications uh, listed here, which address the unique vulnerabilities of children, and in particular, how certain chemicals used in the oil and gas industry could affect them. Next slide. And we do this because we all have children in our lives, whether they're our own or our grandchildren, as these children are for me, or because we care about the legacy that the next generation will receive from us. Next slide. And here I'll briefly review why children are often especially susceptible to toxic exposures. In the perinatal period and childhood, uh, well, these are times of rapid growth and development, and they're accompanied by changes in organ system functioning, metabolic capabilities, the physical size of the children, and their behaviors, which can dramatically modify the effects of toxicant exposure. Given the same amount of exposure to a toxicant, persons will vary in how susceptible they are to disease induced by the exposure. And among those factors are, are our genetic makeup, um, our sex, age, nutritional status, uh, the state of our health baseline, which is inclusive of other diseases, and biochemical differences like our metabolism, the speed of our DNA repair and cell growth, and children's behavior result in differing exposures. We don't quite yet know how a child's characteristics can affect the impacts of toxic substances, but for most of these agents, observations point to increased susceptibility, though not always. 
children's growth and development are dynamic processes. They can be viewed at the molecular, at the cellular, organ, and whole child levels. And what determines the nature and severity of the environmental factors, health effects, is the exposure occurrence within the different developmental stages. So there are these age-specific periods of, sus of susceptibility, and they are variably called either critical windows of exposure or critical windows of development or windows of vulnerability. And again, these are times when children are exquisitely sensitive to any adverse effects of chemicals. Children are at increased risk because of their um, increased exposures and increased vulnerability, um, and that includes their need physiologic need for more food, water, and air per kilogram of body weight compared to adults. These needs result in a greater exposure. Um, at, and it also, because of their behaviors, such as normal and in their normal development, hand-mouth behavior exhibited by toddlers, um, their rapidly growing and developing organ systems, and the central nervous system, uh, and, and lung, which are among those rapidly growing and developing organ systems. Exposure to the same chemical can cause different health outcomes in children compared to adults, and a good example of that is the effects of lead on children's developing nervous systems. Um, it has an effect on adult workers resulting in peripheral neuropathies, but in children it's the intellectual development that's exquisitely sensitive, um, that, and that's not seen in adults. Now, as far as the exposure disease model, um, ATSDR in the next slide is often used to concept, uh, the, the ATSDR model is often used to conceptualize how toxicant exposure occurs. And it's a very busy slide and it's not very clear, but basically the exposure pathway has five parts, a source of contamination, like a fracking site or industrial emissions, uh, environmental medium or transport mechanism like water, uh, moving through a groundwater aquifer or from uh, a wastewater site, a point of exposure uh, like a stream or uh, um, uh, culverts around, uh, uh, at, at roadsides or a private well, a route that includes in children eating, drinking, breathing, touching, and in, in uh, fetal development, transplacental exposure, and of course the receptor population. And when all five parts are present, the exposure pathway is termed a completed exposure pathway. And in oil and gas, it's been very hard to prove, as Dr. Patasol has explained. Next slide. There are multiple factors that enhance a child's opportunity for exposure, and that includes the critical windows of uh, susceptibility, the diets that are different at different stages of development, their inherent different behaviors, um, and physical characteristics like their size, the, um, and differing organ susceptibilities. Um, as an example, the central nervous system development occurring uh, over a pro protracted period, as we saw from the previous speakers. Um, Parental exposures before a child is conceived can result in adverse reproductive uh, effects, as, as we've just heard. And in addition, what we're concerned about in further developmental stages is an infant's respiratory oh, rate being more than twice that of an adult. Um, breastfeeding infants can be exposed to lipophilic contaminants in breast milk. In the first six months of life, children drink seven times as much water per kilo of weight compared to an adult. And um, if you think about a child's skin, um, in the newborn period, the skin is more permeable, and so toxicants can more readily per uh, penetrate children's skin. The fact that children are short, um, they play closer to the ground where many contaminants are, fa are found, and their relative immobility, especially as infants. The toxic exposures that we're concerned about in young uh, and school-aged children um, are partly because children, con in, from ages one to five years, children consume three to four times more food per kilogram of weight compared to adults. 
And um, then there's the behavioral set of behavioral factors and uh, socioeconomic disparities, which I, um, I, I just wanted to mention because um, children who live in poverty uh, more than any other um, group are going to be more impacted uh, by environmental toxins. And um, uh, also children have a longer life expectancy, which increases their risk of adverse outcomes. Um, as far as adolescents, well, just being a an adolescent and their uh, risky behaviors will result in, ex in uh, additional toxic exposures. Um, they suffer, they can suffer if they have jobs from the same on the job exposures as adults would. And again, in, in this age group, this is another time of, of uh, puberty, rapid growth, cell division, and differentiation of many cells, and result, that will result in additional vulnerabilities. And up above there, I, met, I uh, noted an article um, that was published since our report came out, and that's actual measurements uh, of the BTEX metabolites in pregnant women. And this is a pilot study from British Columbia where the authors actually documented higher levels of the metabolite of benzene in the urine of the pregnant women. Of course, this is a pilot study which um, uh, didn't address the additional research that would need to be done to determine what effect this would have. But exposures due to this and new combinations of toxins such as could occur from fracking or gas and oil infrastructure need more attention, something that we've pointed out in all three papers on children. Next slide. Over the last uh, 10 years or so, peer-reviewed um, fi research findings from academic centers have strongly established the connection between uh, toxic uh, contaminants and neurodevelopmental problems. And that's been reviewed by uh, the previous speakers. The purpose of our paper was to highlight how vulnerable populations, particularly newborns and growing children, may suffer from exposure to oil and gas related water and air pollutants. And, and there's really enough evidence that these environmental toxicants can cause neurodevelopmental problems. Um, Dr. Patasol had men mentioned Grandjean, uh, Philippe Grandjean, um, uh, Philippe Grandjean, and Phil Landrigan um, reviewed um, uh, in 2006 uh, neurotoxicants, and they drew attention to how little is known about them. They identified uh, 201 chemicals that are neurotoxic to adults, and more than a thousand chemicals neurotoxic to animals. And um, in 2014, both these same authors updated their review and highlighted newly identified developmental neurotoxicants, and that this list has been growing annually by two substances a year. So we chose to look at five neurotoxicants that affect children that are the product of oil and gas industry, um, heavy metals, particulate matter, BTEX, PAHs, and EDCs. And that we found that these five pollutant groups are associated with neurotoxicity, neuroinflammation, psychomotor effects, and neuromuscular effects, and could also be um, linked to neural tube def defects and neurodevelopmental problems, such as impaired memory, intellectual function, learning problems, and cognitive dysfunction. And finally, we also found that some of these pollutants are associated with other brain disorders, adverse neuropsychological effects, and behavioral problems, including impulsivity, aggression, hyperactivity, and ADHD. And given the profound sensitivity of the developing brain and central nervous system, it's reasonable to conclude, as we did, that young children who experience frequent exposure to these pollutants are at a particularly high risk for chronic neurological diseases. Next slide. We made some recommendations, um, and some of these um, are listed here. Uh, one of those are to increase setback distances from unconventional oil and gas development if it cannot be eliminated altogether, which would be the best uh, result, uh, would result in, in the fewest um, adverse outcomes. Setback distances are intended to protect um, the residents, 
Um, and uh, our results suggest that setbacks, even though we suggest a certain distance of 1.6 kilometers, um, we recommend even greater setbacks because of, um, especially um, because facilities such as schools, hospitals, and other spaces where infants and children might spend a substantial amount of time increase their susceptibility and their exposure. Um, the health burden uh, includes economic and social effects of these adverse neurodevelopmental uh, problems uh, and disorders. These disorders already affect 10 to 15 percent of all births in the United States. And it's reasonable to assume that the risk of these disorders is increasing. And it's important to consider the health consequences of mixed exposures, since most populations are exposed to more than one contaminant at, a time, at, at once. Um, and uh, this is particularly an issue in oil and gas development, where combinations are used. And they're usually called uh, these secret formulas, as Dr. Patasol uh, expressed. And we need to uh, 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 protect the health and ch of children and uh, the families by adopting a precautionary approach uh, when establishing any permitting rules and, and standards for oil and gas development. Um, there should be mental health monitoring before and after unconventional, unconventional oil and gas development because um, these are um, um, uh, sequelae that uh, we have observed in, uh, anecdotally and, uh, and also um, a, a, in adults. And it, it's reasonable to assume that guidelines should be established not just for adults, but also for children, um, um, because uh, success in school is, uh, is, is very important as a um, function of how they, they are going to function as adults. President Clinton had directed in his executive order uh, on children and the environment to reduce environmental health risks and safety risks to children, and this could be included as part of that. And then um, the mandatory testing and international clearinghouse that was suggested in 2014 by Grandjean and Landrigan. Um, so their proposal is mandatory testing of industrial chemicals and the development of an international clearinghouse on neurotoxicity. And um, it would promote optimal brain health, not just the avoidance of neurological activity, um, but it would expose the public and the and um, coordinate research and public policies aiming at protecting brain development during the most sensitive life stages. Next slide. Research needs that we outlined include uh, improved exposure assessment uh, to remove the transparency, um, to remove the lack of transparency in the research barriers imposed by the, starting with the 2005 Energy Policy Act. Uh, the non-disclosure of chemicals creates barriers to efficient research practices um, and contributes to the lack of knowledge, especially in un at unconventional oil and gas development sites and the infrastructure sites. And then some more studies addressing the unique susceptibilities of the fetus, infants, and children, like planning and funding prospective studies on uh, pregnant women and young children um, research on the effects of environmental exposures at different stages, biomarkers of exposure, better characterization of the windows of susceptibility to various toxicants, especially in the oil and gas industry, understanding how breastfeeding affects um, newborn or um, has an impact on newborn exposures uh, in this uh, in the realm of uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and other toxicants. Um, and research uh, about child, uh, in, in, that includes uh, children's behaviors like soil ingestion and how that will impact. So um, I thank you for your uh, for listening, and um, I appreciate uh, the Center for Environmental Health's uh, attention to 
the susceptibility of children. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Jerska, for your really interesting presentation. So we are now going to go ahead and begin the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder to attendees, you can still go ahead and type in your questions in the questions panel. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute all of the panelists, and uh, we we're going to get to as many questions as we can here. Um, the first question I have uh, coming in is for Dr. London, um, which is, um, Dr. London, can you explain why there is increased susceptibility during early brain development to neurotoxins. Um, so it sounds like I think you kind of went into this in the early part, but can you kind of explain why there isn't this increase in susceptibility? Yeah, I, there's many reasons, and uh, it's been uh, gone over in various talks, but uh, the, the probably the baseline reason is because all of the developmental processes are still going on and there are many many ways that the brain can be altered um, by many many things um, and the brain is very much uh, a work in progress so at early stages if things go wrong if you don't build a good foundation the house may collapse and uh, i think that's a pretty good analogy Okay, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Potasal. Uh, Dr. Potasal, uh, the question is, are there effects masculinized or feminized that we talked about in your lecture as a result of EDC exposure? Are any of these uh, reversible? That's a good question. So the thought process is no, that they're not reversible. So the brain is wiring to either function as a male or function as a female. And so if you wire it wrong, or if you wire it to the other sex, then it's not thought that you can reverse that. And so the one example that I showed where you can alter the part of the brain that's controlling LH release for ovulation, there, there's no way that we know of to change that wiring. Um, so once those changes have been made, they're thought to be permanent. Thank you. Next question for Dr. Durska. If there could be one test or data item that could be obtained from populations exposed to UAG, what would it be? Um, well, I, I think it would depend on, um, uh, you, you'll have to go back to that uh, exposure pathway and um, try to determine what is the um, uh, source um, and I, you have to make those scientific studies first because you know to to randomly test uh, a population for uh, uh, chemicals in their bodies it would would be um, and especially in children, is almost impossible. So you have to identify what that p possible source of contamination is and what these people could possibly be exposed to, what the root of exposure is and where they're getting this um, uh, toxicant. Um, you know, there, it, would, it might be possible to test animals that are in the vicinity as well. Um, so there are many, uh, uh, public health challenges when when it comes to to testing for um, exposure um, but if you follow that pathway um, I, I think that uh, you would start at the very beginning and and try to identify what the potential for exposure is and whether whether there is anything to test people for but I wouldn't subject people to ex to um, chemical uh, tests, whether it's in the blood or urine or, or other um, uh, types of tests, simply because there's a possibility that they that they were exposed. You you really have to have some reason to, to do a test, and I think it, it, uh, it uh, following that pathway of exposure would help a lot. Great, thank you, Dr. Patasal. Um, are there 
particular, are there any large-scale studies that you know of uh, looking at EDC exposure, particularly with human populations? Um, yes, there's actually a whole bunch of them. Um, not specifically related to oil and gas development, but there's been a bunch of studies, there's a lot of studies on bisphenol A, an unbelievable number. Um, there's also a lot of studies on phthalates, flame retardants, PCBs, DDT, things like that. So there are real world human examples um, from multiple labs um, in multiple different cohorts and populations where they've been able to link EDC exposure, particularly developmental EDC exposure with a long-term health outcome on neural development in the brain. So a classic one would be PCB exposures and decrements in IQ, and that's been documented globally. Thank you. Uh, Dr. London, uh, I think you, we, being an autism expert, can you tell us a little bit more about what we understand about the link between autism and environmental pollution? Uh, okay, the um, the traditional uh, wisdom in autism, when I say traditional, I mean over the past 30, 40 years, has been that autism is highly genetic. Um, and the evidence for that is that it's uh, much more common in identical twins than fraternal twins. Um, however, there have been some recent articles trying to further break down uh, some of the data. And there was a study out of Stanford about three or four years ago that actually came up with the equation that perhaps as much as 50% of the risk to autism is environmental. Um, if you're gonna talk about autism, you have to understand autism is not one thing. There's probably many causes with many different outcomes. And so it's really a group of disorders, um, which is why it, it, it could be more complicated as to you know what, what's causing it. Um, as I said in my talk, there's, there's one group that was looking into even neurotube closure as a, as a uh, precipitant to autism. Um, um, one of the things that I'm looking into is um, the uh, neuroadrenergic system not functioning adequately, which leads to the symptoms and possibly the brain development. So um, these things could all be caused by multiple sources, including environment. And so we don't have a real lot of knowledge about what uh, environmental causes there are for autism. There are a few studies, two or three studies which implicate um, some pesticides and um, uh, I, I guess the, the particulate matter has been shown for autism too. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Durska, uh, can you talk more about how birth weight may or may not be associated with decreased developmental damage? Uh, sure. Um, it's, it's, uh, there are many studies that have shown that a, a decrease in uh, birth weight um, ha, it, lead, can lead to developmental problems. So um, that's um, that's pretty standard, you know, um, um, knowledge in the pediatric community. Uh, low birth weight uh, contributes to developmental delays. Um, so um, the studies that were shown in Pennsylvania um, and that low birth weight babies around unconventional oil and gas uh, development sites um, are, are more frequent more common, um, I think, should be taken um, with uh, with some you know some uh, with some concern that uh, these children should be followed a little bit more closely. That um, they um, um, could experience developmental delay sometime in the future. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. The next question is for Dr. Patasol. Uh, so, th so the attendee says, thank you for your clear explanation of sex steroid effects on brain development in rodents. Do you think this effect behind Braun's 2011 study that showed different effects of BPA on executive function in girls and boys? Oh, good question. Okay, so it's something that's important to know that's different between rodents and humans is that in, in both rodents and humans, the testis is active in development and at birth. But in rodents, when that testosterone reaches the brain, it will be converted to estrogen. And it's largely estrogen that's masculinizing the rodent brain. In humans, that's not the case. So in humans, that androgen will stay androgen and its activity through androgen receptors is masculinizing. So that's important to keep in mind when we interpret some of the effects that we see in humans. And that's why they don't always match exactly, but the principle is still the same. If you're disrupting estrogen or androgen activity, you're very likely to get effects in one sex versus the other. And that Braun study that um, the, the caller is referring to shows that. It shows effects um, in one sex more pronounced than the other. And so it's very likely that in that case, BTA is inter possibly interfering with some element of sexual differentiation that's contributing to those changes in executive function and externalizing behaviors. Great question. Great, thank you. Uh, next question for Dr. Durska. How would a health registry of persons exposed to UOG be encouraged and used? Um, well, um, health registries um, are being used already. Um, there is one that Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project has instituted, um, and uh, um, the health registry, w um, uh, as, as the title suggests, registers um, the health of people who are in the vicinity of unconventional oil and gas operations. Um, they, in particular, also uh, um, pay attention to the actual uh, patients, so they offer uh, they offer uh, help to these people, so that there's um, uh, the ability to um, look at um, their needs, which could which are uh, which are usually quite. Um, unique um, you know they may need specific referrals so uh, that's one one registry um, the uh, there there are several other uh, there is one other that I know of uh, that um, uh, offers um, residents um, the ability to record and to transmit their complaints to ATSDR directly, and that's through um, the Damascus Citizens for Sustainability. So there are um, uh, uh, the health registry that um, uh, in, it, that is in Southwest at Southwest Pennsylvania Vi Environmental Health Project uh, is up and running, and I, I would suggest people take a look at that um, if, if they want more information about. Um, registering for it. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. London, uh, this isn't really a question, it's more of a request. Uh, if you could send the reference to your published article uh, or your excellent slides. Um, so uh, I'm just going to answer for you to say that uh, I believe Dr. London said that he would be willing to share this information. So after uh, the presentation we close, um, uh, I will be sure to share uh, the person that reached out with this question, the contact information to Dr. London, so you guys can be in touch to get that information. Um, the next question is for Dr. Potasol. Um The question is, could the Cal Enviro screen be used to test for exposure? What was the question again? So this is the the uh, the California Environmental Protection Agency. 
They use okay. the Cal Enviro screen, which is a screening tool used to identify communities uh, that are disproportionately burdened by multiple sources of pollution. We can always follow up. If so the question was, would that work yeah. to detect ED exposure? Yeah, oh, I think right. the question is, yeah, could this be used to test for exposure? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I, we can definitely follow up, um, but I need to look and, and check. I'm familiar with the program, but I don't know how to specifically answer that question off the top of my head, but we could certainly do our homework on that. Okay, so to the person that asked that question, we'll be sure to follow up. Uh, Dr. Pardis, another question. Are these EDCs avoidable only in the home? Or is avoiding exposure only possible on a large scale, such as through policy change? Oh, that's, that's a great question, too. It's going to take both. Um, the nice thing about some EDCs is we know where they are. So for bisphenol LA, for example, there's been several studies now that have shown you can get your exposure to almost zero by changing some lifestyle habits. So if you don't use canned food, if you replace plastic as much as possible and use glass and ceramic, things like that, you can get your exposure down to almost nothing. Um, same with phthalates. If you, change, if you go to fragrance-free products, if you are mindful of the personal care products you use, you can significantly lower exposure. But flame retardants is a big issue. I mean, it's very impossible for people to know what flame retardants are in their wallboard, their couch, the cushions and um, underneath the rugs, things like that. And so that's where we worry about the fracking chemicals and these hidden sources. It's, it's a lack of control. So from my perspective, when we're, you know, as a consumer, if we're going to have this sort of the consumer can decide and vote with their feet kind of mentality, then consumers need to know where these chemicals are. We should know what's in fracking fluid. We should know where it's going. We should know what's in our wallboard. I mean, there should be some disclosure of where some of these chemicals are and how they are used because it changes all the time. If you sample carpet uh, from 10 years ago, its chemical profile is going to look very different than it does today. And so it sort of goes at this question of disclosure and proprietary information because once consumers sort of know where these things are, then we can change our habits or make some decisions about what we are and are not willing to be exposed to. So I, I think it's going to take action on both fronts, um, both on the individual level and on a policy level to get us to a safer space. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Jerska. Uh, so Dr. Jerska, as a pediatrician, are there recommendations that you would suggest for communities in terms of how they can get involved, if they're concerned, what can they do? Um, I think one of the first things to do is to try to educate um, the general public. And you know, it depends on, it depends a little bit on whether you're talking about the medical community or whether you're talking about the general population. Um, I've been involved in gra with grassroots organizations for the past 10 years since um, uh, this issue has um, become one um, in our area. And um, so we, we organized um, uh, at the uh, county level um, and, and we shared information on um, how to um, uh, First, uh, educational information we shared um, to uh, so that our residents. So this was for the general resident population. Um, how the general population could um, advocate, um, make phone calls, be in, start being involved in policy decisions. We also educated our legislators. Um, because they're the ones who make these regulations and, and uh, set policy. Um, very important to educate the medical practitioners. As, uh, as is pretty clear, uh, the medical community is just beginning to become educated on environmental health issues. Um, there is a pediatric environmental health specialties unit um, that 
Act uh, disseminates information, and they have become involved in oil and gas issues. Um, but um, that information needs to be brought to the actual physician. Uh, they may not, you know, it's, it's usually not in your your major medical journals. They'd have to be exposed to it somehow. So you could be the conduit to bring that information to them. Um, flyers, leaflets, trifolds, um, these are all ways that we've used to educate the public. But it, it does have to be uh, directed at a particular population. So, um, you know, it will depend on, on whom you're trying to educate. Uh, but, but that is the first thing, um, is, is education. And that was one of the reasons that uh, our Concerned Health Professionals of New York uh, published uh, and has been updating the compendium on this effect. Great, thank you. A question for Dr. Patasol. Do you have research design recommendations for capturing potential developmental EDC impacts from oil and gas operations in dense urban environments where there are multiple confounding factors? I am thinking about the challenges we face in urban oil drilling in Los Angeles where active extraction facilities operate feet away from residential homes and elementary schools. I've heard ideas from other scientists about trying to find chemical trespass in residents or insects or pets. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence of miscarriages and other neurological behavioral problems like epilepsy. We also have records of what kinds of chemicals are used at these facilities, which include suspected EBCs. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, anytime you have a chemical mixture and and the multiple sources, it's hard. But that's the human landscape. That's that's not just in that unique situation, but that's true everywhere. And so the issue is to try to break it down and sort of figure out which ones are associated most strongly with the outcomes that you're interested in and combine it with a mixture of animal and cell-based and other types of tests. So I explained in detail uh, Chris Kosotis' paper where they took water from these various sites and then used a bunch of cell models to figure out if it's, if it's, an, if it's estrogenic or androgenic or whatever. The next step would then be to partner with a chemist to sort of go into that mixture and find out what chemicals are there. Then you can start looking one chemical at a time and you can start looking at the metabolites and figure out are we talking about three estrogenic chemicals, 10, one, um, and then think about, okay, now that we know that it's this chemical, what are all the known sources? So we do this with flame retardants. We'll even pull um, some of the patents on these chemicals to figure out where and how they might be used. And so there's a sleuthing process that's involved and it's collaborative, um, but it is possible to sort of dive into these complex mixtures and get some pretty good idea about what the bad actors are. There's also some research going on here at NC State and also at Duke to try to figure out can we pin a specific chemical to an oil and gas operation. So things like arsenic are natural. They occur uh, just, you know, in nature. It's, a, it's an element. Um, but there are ways to determine where that arsenic came from, whether it's naturally just in the ground or if it came from some sort of industrial process. And so as those types of chemical engineering tools get better, then it's going to be a lot easier to, to definitively say chemical X came from this source. And that's going to be very helpful in these urban environments. And so some of the technology that's looking at the coal ash spills here in North Carolina and, and in neighboring Tennessee um, and some work being done on fracking sites in West Virginia, I think are going to help dissect apart the, the complexity of the issue that this caller raised. Great, thank you. Uh, so then I have another question here that I think is maybe for anybody. Uh, the question is, has there been any, any look at the impacts of landscape or roadway disposal of liquid oil gas wastes, often called brine or brine spreading? Um, 
I'm just going to jump in. Uh, this is Ellen, and I'm going to say that I know uh, there have been some. There's been some policy work around brine spreading, uh, especially in New York State, um, trying to work on that issue. Um, I don't know uh, of any specific health studies specifically that have looked at that issue, um, but we will certainly uh, take a look at that again. And uh, if we find anything, we will let that person know. So I think we're at the, the end of the webinar. Uh, I want to uh, thank all of the participants, I know everyone that, have, that has joined this session. Uh, thank you for uh, participating and thank you for all your excellent questions. There were a few last questions that we weren't able to get to, unfortunately, but uh, don't worry, we will be sure to uh, get back to you. Um, and also, please feel free to you know email us if there are additional questions that come up. Uh, after the session. Um, I want to also mention that we will be, uh, you know, this, this, this uh, session has been recorded and we hope to have the recording up and available sometime over the next few weeks. Um, and then we possibly will also be doing a survey poll and, dist and distributing that via email. Um, so again, we appreciate everybody for participating, um, especially thank you to each of the speakers for your excellent presentations. Thank you to CEH, and uh, I wish everybody a safe uh, holiday season. So thank you, and take care. <laughs>